Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 1G, where we're talking more about some features of genes that we haven't discussed yet. In particular, we'll talk about the very peculiar phenomenon of introns and splicing, and we'll talk about how cells, and particularly how geneticists, identify genes. Now, this is kind of, to me, this is an embarrassing topic because it so strongly contradicts my pleasure in the beauty and elegance of molecular biology. Because this is a messy and apparently unnecessary phenomenon that just makes life more complicated for cells. Most protein coding genes include segments that aren't protein coding at all. They're called introns and they have to be cut out. The term we use is they need to be spliced out of the RNA before it's a functional messenger RNA and is ready to be translated into protein. The segments that are kept are called exons, and I said the segments that are discarded are called introns. So here's a diagram of a fairly typical gene. It's got, here's the DNA, here's the regulatory signals for transcription, the promoter here, the terminator here, and here's what's transcribed into RNA. But only some of this codes for protein. In particular, there are long segments called introns that don't code for protein at all, and they have to be cut out and discarded. There are shorter segments, typically, that do code for proteins that have to be joined together when the other segments are cut out. There are also two segments at the beginning at the end that usually are not transcribed but are part of the mature messenger RNA. There's a short segment at the beginning, which usually includes the ribosome binding site before the start codon, and a short segment at the end, which will include the stop codon and a little bit of sequence after it, that it is not going to be translated. Now, the next slide is a sort of a schematic of how splicing happens. So here again, we have now just, we have a gene with a promoter and a terminator, a promoter and a terminator, and it includes segments that are going to be removed. These segments are the introns. These are recognized by the splicing machinery because of particular regulatory sequences, recognition sequences, at the beginning and end, the junction points, the splice points of the introns. And this allows the cell to recognize the places where it needs to cut out sequences. So the sequences that code for protein, the exons, are joined together into a mature messenger RNA, and the intervening sequences, that's where the word intron comes from, are discarded. Now, in the context of this course, you don't need to know much about introns at all. You need to know that they exist. They're very important for understanding overall the genome, but we're not going to discuss them in any detail, and you don't need to know anything about how splicing works. Now, so here's the structure of a generic gene again. This particular generic gene has only got a single intron, but it's got a, all of the regulatory sequences that you need to think about. The um, regulatory sequences that um, where transcription factors tell ribos RNA polymerase where to look for a promoter. The promoter, the start codon, oh, left out the ribosome binding site, codons, an intron with its regulatory junctions, stop codon, um, transcriptional terminator sites. And natural selection has acted on all of these sequences to optimize their function so that it's acted on the coding sequences to optimize the combination of amino acids, even the order that the amino acids are in in the chain to give the best function for the protein. It's acted on the introns, on the splice junctions for correct excision. It's 
acted on all of the regulatory sequences, the strength of the promoter, which transcription factors bind to optimize when the gene is expressed and how strongly it's expressed. Now, we talked already about how cells identify genes. I'm just going to go over it again quickly. First, regulatory proteins recognize and bind to DNA near to the promoter. RNA polymerase then binds at the promoter and initiates transcription. It makes an RNA version of one strand of the DNA. And when it recognizes a terminator sequence, it releases the new RNA. The introns are spliced out um, due to recognition sequences in the intron. And the ribosome binding site and start codon direct translation. Now, this is nothing like how geneticists identify genes. We use in ways that seem more sophisticated to us, but really the cell is much better at it than we are. So geneticists really have two fundamentally different ways of identifying genes. One is genetic analysis. And this started with the very first geneticists back in the day of, of Mendel, who used crosses between pea plants with different phenotypes to investigate the patterns of inheritance. What did the progeny look like? How many of each kind were there? And from that, he inferred the existence of genes controlling the properties he was studying. And many, many geneticists in the 150 years since then have used the same strategy to identify a great deal about what genes there are and how they work. Molecular geneticists, now we have access to enormous quantities of DNA sequences relatively cheaply. And that means that it's possible to do a lot of genetic analysis and a lot of analysis without any um, crosses. So we use, in many cases, we supplement or complement the genetic analysis, the crosses, with sequence analysis where we use computers to analyze DNA sequences and to identify the genes that they encode. So here's my sort of cartoon of using a computer to identify the gene in a string of bases. Now, to think about this, we need to first build on the concept of reading frames that we developed in the last lecture. So we talked about how there are six reading frames in any double-stranded DNA. Three frames going that way, three frames going that way. Um, and we can mark off the three, three base codons in three different ways, depending on where we start. Now, to a, a computer, to a molecular geneticist, an open reading frame is a section of the DNA that starts with an ATG or an AUG, depending on whether we're looking at a DNA sequence or an RNA sequence. For this, we treat them basically interchangeably. So the segment starts at a start codon and read in threes ends with a stop codon that's in the same reading frame. So here's our start point set by the first open, the first start codon. Now, is the segment that I've marked off in yellow a, a, a open reading frame? Well, no, not really. It's only part of a reading frame because it stops at this TAG. TAG is a stop codon, but it's not a stop codon in the reading frame that we're using. This is our reading frame in black set by this ATG. And this TAG, this stop codon, is a reading is a stop codon in this reading frame, but it's not a stop codon in the reading frame that we're using. So this was only a partial open reading frame. The real open reading frame extends all the way to the next stop codon that's actually in frame. Now it can be moot whether you include the stop codon in the reading frame or in the open reading frame or not. Now, finding open reading frames is only the very first step in finding genes with a computer. Um, many open reading frames are not genes at all. So we use additional features to decide 
if we're looking at something that might actually be a gene. And here's an example of a DNA sequence that has been translated by a computer in all of its possible reading frames. Three reading frames going that way, three reading frames going that way. And in each case, the open reading frames have been marked off. So this is a short open reading frame read that way from that methionine to a stop codon here. This is a relatively long open reading frame. We don't know where it ends going in that direction from this methionine. So first we look for long open reading frames and usually we ask, the computer asks, we set the computer to ask that they be greater than 50 or 100 amino acids. AA amino acids. Um, then the computer checks for sequences that, rep, rep, that resemble promoter and terminator sequences and checks for similarity to known genes. Find, because of the relation to the way genes arise, which I'm going to discuss in um, one of the upcoming videos, looking for similarity to known genes is a very powerful way to identify genes. So what have we done? We've talked about how gene expression is controlled by regulatory sequences. In particular, we talked about introns and how regulatory sequences at the junctions allow them to be spliced out of messenger RNA and discarded. We talked about how real and potential genes are recognized by the cell. And in particular, we talked about how geneticists recognize genes, both in organisms through crosses and in DNA sequences through sequence analysis. Coming up next is a little um, lecture that I put together to help you try and make sense of these very complicated processes. Uh, many students are, find it very easy to get confused about replication, transcription, translation, and so the next lecture is an attempt to clarify these relationships. I hope to see you there.